Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Patrice Alexander Ficklin, and I have the honor of serving as the founding director of the CFPB's Office of Fair Lending and Equal Opportunity. I also have the honor this morning of introducing the director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, Kathleen Craninger. Director Craninger will help us kick off today's programming. Director Craninger became the second confirmed director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau in December 2018. From her early days as a Peace Corps volunteer to her role in establishing the Department of Homeland Security to her policy work at the Office of Management and Budget and to the CFPB, Director Craninger has dedicated her career to public service, and it's my privilege to welcome her today. Director Craninger. Thank you so much, Patrice, for that introduction, and thank you to all for joining us this morning as we continue the events of Consumer Financial Protection Week. Very excited about uh, the event today so that we can talk about uh, the important work that the CFPB does, and certainly that is absolutely true in the fair lending context, and glad to have Patrice here to, to lead the way and do what's going to be, I know, a very informative uh, presentation on, on the issues around the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act and some of the other uh, activities of the Fair Lending Office and the agency in this area. But focusing in on the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, or HMDA, um, I wanted to run through, again, as an introduction, a few things about Bureau's work uh, on behalf of the interagency because HMDA data is uh, relied upon by not just the CFPB for our mission, but so many other federal agencies and partners, uh, as well as stakeholders. So as the name implies, the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act is a disclosure law that requires certain mortgage lenders to collect uh, and report information about mortgage loan applicants and applications, I should say, including information about applications that are denied. Each year, thousands of institutions report mortgage loan data under HMDA, uh, making it the most comprehensively publicly available uh, information on the mortgage market. In June, uh, we reported that more than 5,500 institutions filed information on more than 15 million home loan applications last year. And on behalf of the Federal Financial Institutions Examination Council, the FFIEC, and the Department of Housing and Urban Development, the CFPB receives that data, processes it, and provides the information to the public in a variety of HMDA data products. Since taking over the HMDA processing function from the Federal Reserve Board, the Bureau has innovated to decrease the reporting burden, improve data accuracy, and expand access to the data. The Bureau, in fact, now is organizing, organizing one of its first tech sprints uh, to bring together HMDA stakeholders to further innovate in this area. And I encourage those interested in participating in our tech sprints to look for additional information available on our website about this new collaborative program, bringing together regulators, technologists, software providers, consumer advocates, and financial institutions to develop solutions to compliance challenges. The HMDA data that mortgage lenders report to the CFPB, uh, as, I, as I noted earlier, also help other federal state regulators, policymakers, researchers, economists, uh, industry members, and consumer advocates study and analyze the trends uh, in the mortgage market. The information is used uh, for a variety of purposes, including general market and economic monitoring, as well as to assess housing needs, public investment, and possible discrimination under numerous federal and state laws. Um, that is a responsibility that the CFPB takes incredibly seriously, and we do uh, monitor closely to understand which, which institutions have submitted data, how they are complying, we also manage a warning letter process. Uh, if we believe there are institutions that perhaps uh, might not be aware of their compliance requirement to reach out to them and ensure that if they meet the reporting requirements that they are in fact reporting. Um, when mortgage lenders fail to report HMDA data as required, they are in fact violating the law and they're hindering uh, the ability of the CFPB and others to identify discrimination and uh, discriminatory lending practices including redlining, 
for, uh, in addition, uh, unmet credit needs in the United States in the communities, uh, including low and moderate income serving uh, areas. Just last year during my tenure, the CFPB did in fact uh, resolve a lawsuit against Freedom Mortgage Corporation, one of the 10 largest mortgage lenders nationwide, imposing a $1.75 million fine uh, for reporting inaccuracies in HMDA data. And, and this is an enforcement action that sent a very clear message again about how serious we are about compliance with federal law and the requirements of HMDA. The, the information uh, that is collected uh, gets to uh, an applicant's race, ethnicity, and sex. And those consumers who are applying for a loan uh, are asked those questions precisely so that, uh, as I noted, all of the individuals and entities that make use of this data would have that uh, if the consumer so chooses to respond. And so it is incredibly important to provide that information so that we can monitor what's happening in the mortgage market. Uh, before turning it over, uh, back to Patrice and to the rest of the fair lending team. I'd also like to mention um, that we have made uh, uh, efforts really as, as the HMDA data um, has evolved and improved and the amount of information that is available and the technology that makes it available to the public has uh, continued to evolve. Uh, the Bureau has uh, really worked hard to make sure that those users of the system understand how to access the data and make the most of it. In the summer of 2018, Bureau staff conducted user research with community groups to determine ways that we could improve the tools, the reports, and the other resources that we offer to help the public use HMDA data. The results from this engagement informed the development of our new HMDA data browser and improvements made to other HMDA reports and resources that we offer on our website consumerfinance.gov, and also that's available uh, through the FFIEC um, at ffiec.cfpb.gov. I'm particularly pleased that we have the opportunity to share uh, with you specific information on how to use the browser. The HMDA data browser is something that Bureau staff have uh, put significant effort on to, into, and that we will continue to make improvements to be responsive to the users of the system. And so this is an ongoing uh, engagement. Uh, as with all the other work the Bureau does, we are constantly looking for ways to improve and build upon um, particularly transparent access to the information that we have available that is useful to those users. Uh, and so I think uh, that's an important um, avenue. Uh, I know one that, that Patrice and I are, are uh, very committed to and share is that openness to that feedback and we will certainly uh, let you know what we can and cannot do. And if we can do it, uh, we will make it happen. So uh, those are things that uh, I will certainly commit to you. So thank you again for joining and I will turn it back to Patrice. Indeed, thank you very much, Director Craninger. And thanks to everyone who's joining us virtually this morning. Again, my name is Patrice Alexander Ficklin, Director of the Bureau's Office of Fair Lending and Equal Opportunity. And I'm here with two members of my very talented team, Senior Fair Lending Counsel Tim Lambert and Fair Lending Research Analyst Abby Hogan. We are here today to speak about the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, or HMDA, and the role it plays in protecting America's consumers. I hope that you enjoy the information we will provide and that you leave with a greater appreciation of the importance of HMDA to the Bureau's fair lending work and a better understanding of the Bureau's HMDA resources available to you. I'll begin by saying a few words about the Bureau's Office of Fair Lending and the Bureau's Fair Lending efforts. The Office of Fair Lending and Equal Opportunity is located in the Director's Office of Equal Opportunity and Fairness. The Office of Fair Lending, which was established under the Dodd-Frank Act, coordinates the Bureau's efforts to fulfill its responsibilities to ensure fair, equitable, and non-discriminatory access to credit for both individuals and communities. Our office coordinates the Bureau's fair lending work both internally and with other governmental agencies, civil rights organizations, consumer groups, and industry. One of our most important responsibilities is stakeholder engagement including engagement with consumers like you. We have an obligation to educate stakeholders about fair lending compliance and access to credit issues 
and to hear stakeholder views on the Bureau's work to inform our policy decisions. The Bureau is committed to communicating directly with all stakeholders on its policies, compliance expectations, and fair lending priorities, and to receiving valuable input about ways to address lending discrimination and ways to promote fair, equitable, and non-discriminatory access to credit. The Office of Fair Lending's mission is to advance the CFPB's role as a national leader in ensuring fair, equitable, and non-discriminatory access to credit for individuals and communities. The Office of Fair Lending drives the CFPB's fair lending priorities and also facilitates national dialogue and collaboration on fair lending efforts. As noted by Director Craninger, the Bureau relies on HMDA data to help protect consumers from discrimination and in the Bureau's efforts to fulfill our fair lending mission and vision. I will say more about how the CFPB uses HMDA data to protect America's consumers a little later. But now I will turn it over to Tim Lambert, who has the distinction of serving as the chair of the HMDA subcommittee for the Federal Financial Institutions Examination Council. Tim will provide background information on HMDA, including the types of mortgage transactions and the specific data points reported under the law. And then he will turn it over to Abby Hogan, who will provide a tutorial on how to use our HMDA data browser. Tim? Thank you, Patrice, and good morning, everyone. I will say a little bit about the history of HMDA. It was first enacted by Congress in 1975 and is implemented by a regulation called Regulation C, first promulgated by the Federal Reserve Board, and now over which the Bureau has jurisdiction. Both the statute and the regulation have been amended several times over these decades, but their, the statutory and regulatory purposes of HMDA remain the same, which are to help show whether financial institutions are serving the housing needs of their communities, to assist public officials in distributing public sector investment, to attract private investment in areas where it is needed, and to assist with the identification of possible discriminatory lending patterns and enforcement of anti-discrimination laws, about which we'll be talking more this morning. So one basic question about HMDA is what sort of transactions you'll find there. They are mortgages secured by a dwelling, and they include both single-family homes and multifamily dwellings, and they also include both purchase loans and refinancings, pre-approval requests, and applications, whether they were originated or not, including secondary market purchases. Home equity lines of credits are sometimes called HELOCs, and other credit secured by dwelling is also included in the HMDA data set. And finally, it includes reverse mortgages and manufactured housing loans. I'll go over briefly some of the data points that are included within the data set. First, with regard to applicants, the data set includes information about race, ethnicity, sex, age, income, the applicant's debt to income ratio and credit score. And then regarding the application itself, there's information about the automated underwriting system and automated underwriting system return, the application channel, the reason for denial if the application were denied, the application date, and whether there was a pre-approval request. Regarding the property that secures the dwelling, there is the property location, the lien status, which means whether it is a first lien or a subordinate lien, the property value, the combined loan-to-value ratio, sometimes called the CLPV, and the construction method. So that's whether it's a traditional site-built home or whether it's manufactured housing. There's some additional information just about manufactured housing. And then also the total units, the number of units, the number of multifamily affordable units, and the 
occupancy type, which is whether it is a principal residence or some other occupancy type. In addition, there are data points about the transaction itself. So those include the loan type, purpose, and amount, the action taken, and the action taken date, the type of purchaser of a loan, if there was a purchase in the same year as the origination, the rate spread above a benchmark rate, OPA status, whether it is a higher cost loan, and then a number of data points about the cost of the loan, these taken primarily from the disclosures that are provided to consumers. So those include the total loan costs or total points and fees, the origination charges, discount points, lender credits, and the interest rate. So also included regarding the transaction are whether the transaction has a prepayment penalty term, the loan term and the introductory rate period if there is one, both of those in terms of months, whether there are non-amortizing features, and then three flags to indicate whether the transaction is a reverse mortgage, an open end line of credit, or a commercial or business purpose loan. So who uses Honda data? We'll start with looking at the users within the federal government. Those, of course, include the Bureau, which I'll talk more about in a moment, and the Department of Justice, the FIREA agencies, including the bank regulatory agencies, and the Department of Housing and Urban Development, or HUD. But also, users include state banking regulators and attorneys general, and consumer groups, compliance vendors, financial institutions, who often look to Honda data for new business opportunities or to understand how they compare with their peers, and private parties, academics, and researchers, and those include congressional researchers. So looking within the Bureau, there are many users of Honda data, and so those include uh, within our supervision function or our bank exams, enforcement, fair lending, of course, markets, regulations to help inform the Bureau's rule writings, research, and uh, in a little bit we'll highlight some of the sort of research that's available to the public based on the Humda data. Our technology and innovation team, our legal division, and more. So to talk about who uses, who can access Humda data, I'll turn the presentation over to Abby Hogan. Okay, great. Thank you, Tim. Um, so the spoiler alert here, the answer to who can access the HUMS data is you can. Every single person on this call today can access the HUMSA data. Um, they're available to the public. And we're going to do a live demo today um, going online to ffic.cfpb.gov uh, to show you how it works. So on this website, you can do basic searches, like finding out how many mortgages were originated in your area or which lenders are based near your home. Um, but it can also be used to do more sophisticated analyses. Maybe you're a compliance officer and you want to see what your institution's fair lending risk looks like. Um, this data set really has something for everyone. Okay, so we are going to go ahead and do a live demo of the website just to kind of show you how it works and how easy it is to use. So I will go ahead here and share my screen with you all. Okay, and let's go ahead and start here at ffic.cfpb.gov. Uh, and you can see this is a great landing page with so many different resources um, available to you. Uh, you can see there are a lot of different guides. If you're not familiar with the Humda data and you want to get acclimated, there are so many different ways to, um, to be introduced to the data and all of its variables. Um, a lot of tools, maybe compliance officers would find this helpful. And then data publication. This is where we get access to the data itself. So let's go ahead and click um, into the Honda Data Browser right at the top of this page here. This is a great way to get started if you've never been introduced to the Honda Data. Go ahead and click Honda Data Set Filtering. And let's go ahead and see how we would find out, say I'm a first time home buyer um, and I want to find out how many mortgages are being originated 
uh, like in my city, state, county, what have you. Uh, let's go ahead and start at the top. We can select a year of Humda data and you have a few years available. Let's just stick with 2019. And then you have the option to select a geography. So there are four choices here. Uh, you can filter by state, county, metropolitan statistical area or metropolitan division, as well as nationwide. Um, and this is a really cool tool because it's dynamic and it's very um, easy to adjust if you make a mistake. So let's go ahead and check maybe Pittsburgh. Let's select MSA for Metropolitan Statistical Area. And let's see how many home purchase loans were originated in Pittsburgh uh, just last year. So as we start typing, you can see that this tool will adapt dynamically and will filter the results for you. Um, and what if we selected the wrong thing? Let's see, we, we did add Pittsfield, Massachusetts too, but we only want Pittsburgh. We can just hit this little X and we don't lose the other things we've done. So it's very easy to use. And then uh, we could go ahead, if we wanted to see a particular financial institution, this tool is really helpful for that. If, for example, you're shopping between a few different financial institutions and you wanted to see who's doing more business or what types of loans they're offering, you could do that. For this example, we're just going to leave this blank or select all financial institutions. And you can see that the data browser has filtered this nicely for us. So it tells us how many financial institutions are operating in this geography. And then let's go ahead and collect some filters down here. Um, let's begin with action taken. This is a really, really helpful one for almost anyone accessing the Honda data. Um, I would recommend starting, starting here if you're not sure what to filter on. Um, so as Tim was talking about, the Honda data includes a lot of different information. So maybe you just want to know about originated loans, which um, for this first example, I think that's what we'll do. But maybe you want to know about applications. So all the applications, even if they were denied or even if the um, consumer decided not to originate them, say they were approved but not accepted, that would be action taken codes one through five. Um, action code six is the purchases on the secondary market. So um, say you originate a mortgage, you get a mortgage, and then your financial institution sells it to another financial institution. That's what this action code six is. So if you include action code one and six, you could theoretically be including the same loan twice, uh, just two different things that happened to it in the market that year. And then seven and eight are our pre-approval. So these are when a consumer is um, thinking about applying for a mortgage but hasn't gone through the full origination process. So for our um, analysis here, let's just stick with the originations. And then uh, let's do loan purpose as well here. Um, you can see you can filter whether it's the loan is for a home purchase, a home improvement loan, refinancing, or some other purposes. Let's just stick with home purchase loans. So what we're doing here is being in 2019 in the Pittsburgh metro area, um, how many home purchase originations there were. So we could download this and do some other things with it. We'll do that in another example, but let's just hit view summary table. And we can find our answer that easily. Uh, you can see we get this nice table that tells us how many records. So that means there were 27,646 um, home purchase originations in Pittsburgh last year. And then it gives us this nice dollar amount as well. Um, and so this is cool because it means you don't have to have any software. This is something that you can just access online. You don't have to have any special tech savvy. Um, so it's a really great tool for folks who want to find answers to more simple questions. Uh, maybe you don't have a lot of tech options at home, um, but it's just so easy to use. So that is the first example of something you can do with the Humda data. Let's go ahead and go back to this main page and look at some of the other tools available to us. So let's check out this data publication area. And we have a lot of different options here. I'll just show you one today that I actually use a lot. Um, and this is in the snapshot national loan level data set. So we're going to pick a year. Um, I'll pick, let's pick 2018. Um, but you can pick you have all this information for all these different years. So we'll start with 2018 for now. Um, and you can see all of these different data sets. There's so many data sets available to you on this website. Um, the first one, the data browser is using the, the loan application register, so the LAR. 
And that has a row for each of the mortgage records, each application or each origination. Um, I also want to introduce you to the transmittal sheet, the TS. Um, any compliance officers on this call will be familiar with this. Um, this has one row for every financial institution that submits HMDA data. Um, so it's a cool way to get acclimated to the entities that are reporting. So we can go ahead and click CSV, it stands for comma separated values, and this will download as a text file that works really nicely in Excel. Let's go ahead and open that up. So uh, you can see at the top here, we can get, um, for every Humda reporter in that year, we can get the legal entity identifier. This is the unique identifier for each financial institution, as well as the tax ID, the agency code, which tells us who their federal regulator is, the respondent name, as well as some information about each financial institution. So we can see their city, state, and zip code where they're based, as well as how many records they submitted to Humda data. Um, and then if we scroll all the way down, we can see how many there are. So in 2018, what is this? Say more than 5,600 Humda reporting institutions. That's a lot. Um, so it's, this is a cool way to get acclimated to the reporters. Um, I'll just do a little bit more with this just to see. Maybe you want to see who is um, who's headquartered near you, for example. You want to see which financial institutions are located near your home. So I'll use my home state as an example. I'm originally from New Hampshire, which is a little tiny state. Let's see if there are any financial institutions that are from New Hampshire. So let's go ahead and just filter that. And wow, there are actually quite a few, more than I would expect. Um, so we get this nice list of institutions. We could even filter it further if we wanted to see like your particular city. And over on the right, again, we have the number of records they submitted. So we could also sort to see, you know, who's the largest, who's the smallest. Um, so we can see the largest Humda reporter from New Hampshire um, submitted more than 5,000 Humda records, which is a lot, it's sizable. And then the smallest one we submitted one. So there's like quite a variety just in a single state. Um, so we will come back to this transmittal sheet in a moment, actually. Um, but I wanted to familiarize everyone with that because it's a really cool resource that's available. Okay. Um, so let's try out a more advanced analysis. Um, maybe you're a compliance officer, maybe you work for a consumer advocate group, and you want to understand um, some patterns in the lending and see if there is some fair lending risk or just basically understand how the market's working in one of the areas that you are operating in. So let's go ahead, we'll just start the home page again so that you know how to find all this yourself. Um, and let's go to the data browser. This is a great example. We use the data browser for a really simple analysis and now we're gonna use it for a more um, complex analysis. So we'll select Humda data set filtering again. And we'll stick with 2018. Um, and let's do, this is a pretty complex one. Let's go ahead and look to see the distribution of loans in Birmingham, Alabama. And let's see um, what percentage of the loans for each lender are coming from minority neighborhoods. Um, so this is kind of like a, a baby sibling to a, a full-blown redlining analysis. It's a, a dipping your toes into a little bit of fair lending risk analysis. So again, we'll start here with the year. Let's stick with 2018. And then we will select our geography. So Birmingham is a city, metropolitan area. So let's pick MSA, and we'll just start typing Birmingham. Cool. And then financial institutions, again, this will filter for the number of financial institutions in that MSA. We've got 508, um, and we want to keep them all in because we want to see uh, who's getting the most applications from minority neighborhoods, who's getting the least, how do they all do compared to one another. So let's leave that in. Okay, and then our filters, again, um, we'll, when we go back to the PowerPoint deck, we'll go over this, but just be really careful as you're making, um, making these more complex analyses and trying to draw some sort of conclusion from it, uh, this requires some discretion. It requires you feeling comfortable with the data before you go ahead and say, oh, there's a problem here, or, oh, we should do something else. Um, so just be thoughtful with your filters, and then also consider the other information that you don't have from the Humda data that could be explaining some of the patterns that you're seeing. 
So let's go ahead and select action taken. Um, for this analysis, we're going to use all the applications, not just the originations, because we want to kind of see where these applications are coming from, not necessarily which ones were originated. So let's do action taking codes one, two, three, four, and five. And then we'll also do the loan purpose filter again, and let's just stick to home purchases, because um, the type of loans going out for like a home improvement loan uh, might be different for some reason in a way we don't understand. So let's just try to compare apples to apples. So again, let's start with the summary table. This is a great gut check to make sure that these numbers are what you're expecting. Um, let's say, for example, I had um, mistyped something. Let's say I had, I don't know how you can misspell New York for Birmingham, but let's say I had added New York City here. And then I go down here and I view the summary table and it's telling me that I have 163,000 records. And I, if I know Birmingham, I know that would be an unreasonable number of loans in one year to go to Birmingham. Um, so I'd come back up here and say, oh, where did I go wrong? And I'd say, oh, my goodness, I added all of New York City. So we'll just delete it. And again, we don't lose all of these other filters that we've added in. So, okay. So let's see our summary table, and you can see we have 24,000 rows. That seems a little bit more like what we would expect. Um, and this is also helpful if you're trying to figure out um, like your technological capabilities here. So if you're a consumer and you're thinking about buying a home, maybe you're limited to just what you can do in the browser itself. And maybe if you're a compliance officer or a consumer advocate, maybe you have access to Excel or something like that. Um, or maybe if you're, um, if you're really fortunate, you have access to, to some more sophisticated statistical software. Um, and so this number is really helpful for any sort of analytical person to tell them what kind of software they need to use to take it from here. So if this number is less than 1 million, um, it means you can use Excel, basically, is, um, is one of the cutoffs for you. So this number tells us this is a number that's very manageable to do a more advanced analysis in Excel. We don't need any special software beyond that. So let's go ahead and download this data set and do a little bit of work in Excel. Um, and I can show folks a few um, tips and tricks that I use at work um, and that maybe you'll find helpful for working with the Humda data. So let's open up this file. And as we saw, we've got, scroll down, you can see we've got 24,000 records. So that's a, that's a lot for, for most people on this call, I think. Um, it's a lot to work with. Probably not everyone loves using Excel spreadsheets. So where do you start? Where do you even begin to understand that data? What if you're a compliance officer, you were just hired, and someone wants you to say, well, do we have any fair lending risk? And you don't even know where to begin. Um, here is one way to at least get acclimated with your data and begin to get a little bit more comfortable doing a deeper dive. So let's go ahead and click on this triangle in the upper left-hand corner of the Excel um, file, and then select all of the data in our Excel sheet. And then if we go to insert here, we can insert a pivot table. And this is a really great tool um, if you are trying to assess a lot of data and get it into a really nice compact um, analytical format. So you'll get this pop up here. Um, if you're not an advanced user of Excel, just leave the defaults as they are. As you get more advanced, you may want to change some of these, but just leave them for now. And let's again, um, always go back to the call of the question as an analyst. So what are you trying to figure out? You wanna know um, for each financial, financial institution in Birmingham, um, how many applications they're getting from minority neighborhoods. So let's think through which Honda fields you need in order to do that. So the first thing you need is a list of all the financial institutions. So where do you find that? Um, as we said earlier, the legal entity identifier, LEI, um, is that. That's the unique identifier for every financial institution. So let's pull that down into the rows. And just like that, really easily, you have a list of every um, LEI for Birmingham. Um, and we'll come back to adding the names of these institutions, too, in a minute, so don't worry about that. Uh, and then the next thing we need is how do we figure out if an application came from a minority census tract? Well, you are in luck. Um, unlike the data set I get to work with, this data set already has census data appended. You don't have to do it yourself. 
Um, so at the end here, you see all these fields that start with tracked. Um, so these are all census fields that have been appended for you, and they're so helpful. Um, so let's use this track minority population percent, which will tell us the percentage of each um, census tract population that self-identified as being um, a member of a minority group. So let's pull that over into the columns. Okay. And then we get this really messy looking list of every number from zero to 100. And what on earth do we do with that? So um, I would recommend just grouping these. You're gonna find this a lot in Humza data where you have um, so many different fields and some of them are these numerical ranges like this. Um, and just putting them into more manageable groups will make it easier to digest your analysis. So let's go ahead and just do three groups here. Uh, we can do low minority, mixed minority, and high minority. So we'll go ahead and select everything from zero to 49% minority and call that low minority. Um, and so we'll just select it all, like use our cursor, highlight all of everything from zero to 49. It's a little tedious, but I promise the pay, payoff of doing so is really helpful. Um, and then we'll right click and select group. And then we'll just go ahead and label it here. Do 49% minority. Okay, and just two more times here. So let's do the same thing for 50 to 79% or mixed minority. Again, right click, select group. We'll do 50 to 79% minority. And then the last one we'll do 80 to 100% high minority. Um, and there are so many different ways, I should note, there are a lot of different ways you can um, like categorize your data. So this is just one that I'm using. This is certainly not um, like any sort of gold standard or hard and fast rule. This is just what I'm using for this example. Okay. Cool. So now we have our grouping, and this is starting to look a lot more manageable, right? Um, but we still have a blank table, which is not particularly helpful. So let's go ahead and fill that in. How do we do that? Well, we need a count of the Humda LAR records in here. So in order to count the records, we need to have a field um, that we can count. Um, so the LEI is a great one because it's never a blank. So every Humda law record will have an LEI, a legal entity identifier associated with it. Um, so that's a good way if you wanna do a count of the records, you can count the LEI. So let's go back up here to LEI and we'll drag that into the values field. And you can see it automatically reverts to count. Um, if this was a numerical field, like say this was the loan amount or something and you want to do average loan amount, you can go to the value field settings here and you could select a different, um, like you could do average if you wanted to instead of count if it were a numerical field. Okay, so this actually answers our question. It's not very pretty, we'll fix that in a minute. Um, but this was, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes to find the answer to the distribution of every single loan and every single lender in Birmingham. So it's a pretty cool analysis that you can do with nothing other than the data browser and Excel. Um, let's take it just one step further. Let's go back to our transmittal sheet um, and add in the entity names here. This is also um, a good skill if you're a compliance officer and you have another data set, for example, that you want to add together. Um, say you have, I don't know, maybe you have the um, information about how the loan came to you and you want to do some sort of analysis for marketing purposes. Um, this is a great way to be able to match different data sets together. So we'll just move this on to the same file um, for ease of use here. So we have our original data set, every um, home purchase application in Birmingham. We have our pivot table we just made and then the transmittal sheet that we went over um, a little while ago. So let's go ahead and add in the respondent name to this file. Um, and again, this is just one example of, of, of how this could be useful, but there could be so many different data sets that you want to put together in order to conduct more robust analysis. So let's do something in Excel. It's called a VLOOKUP function. Um, you just type VLOOKUP, uh, and it even describes that you get this nice little pop-up, looks for the value 
um, and what's this column on the table. So we'll go through. Um, Excel actually tries to walk you through it, although some of these names are not particularly intuitive. We'll walk through it together. So you'll type the lookup, and then Excel tells you you're going to need four things in order to match between two data sets. So the first thing you need is the lookup value. That is what field you're matching on. With Humda data, it is almost invariably going to be the LEI, the legal entity identifier. Um, the next thing you need is the table array, and that is telling Excel where you want it to look for the data. So we want it to look in the transmittal sheet. So we'll highlight, let's look everywhere between the LEI and the respondent name. But we've highlighted four columns. So the next thing Excel needs is the column index number, which is which of these four columns um, to look for the name in. So you can see we've got one, two, three, four, and the respondent name is in the fourth column. So we'll let's put four here. And the last one is whether you want an approximate or an exact match. Um, I would just type false here for an exact match, um, unless you are more advanced with Excel than I am, because I have never gotten the approximate match to work. So we've got our formula in here, hit enter, and it's like magic, it just appears. The name is now matched to the LEI. Um, but we have 24,000 records. We don't want to do that 24,000 times. So let's go ahead and just copy it into the whole column. So let's do control C, copy and then select the column and control V. And um, like magic, the whole thing will populate. So all of the entity names there for us, pretty cool. Um, if you're gonna keep using this stuff in Excel, I would recommend pasting just the names. You can see if we click on any of these, they also have Excel formulas in them. Um, so that means that if you try to do any sort of analysis, Excel is going to recalculate the formulas every time, and it's going to run really slowly. So I would just select this whole column and do copy, and then paste the values, um, and that'll make everything run a lot more smoothly for you. Okay, so let's go back to your pivot table. Um, before we can add this, so let's say we wanted to take out the LEI and add the names. If we search for that field we just added, it's not going to be here because we haven't refreshed the pivot table to include it. So let's go ahead and refresh that so that um, Excel knows to check for the new data we just added. And then we'll be able to see that new field and to add it into our table. Okay, there we go. So now we can search for the name again. And now it is there, and we can pull it right down. So cool. So this is exactly what we were looking for. We have a list of every single financial institution in the Birmingham metro area, and a list of how many applications they got from low minority, mixed minority, and high minority neighborhoods. Um, from there, there's so much you could do with this. Um, if you're a compliance officer and you want to say, oh, well, how am I doing compared to the rest of the market? You can just go ahead and calculate like, how many loans are coming from each of these groups um, and see how your financial institution compares. Are you getting more applications from minority neighborhoods or fewer? Um, and thinking about some of the, the reasons why that might be. Um, so we can see from this analysis, this maybe took us 20 minutes, um, that 88% of the applications in Birmingham are coming from low minority neighborhoods. Um, and only 4% are coming from high minority neighborhoods. So really powerful analysis. I think this would be a really helpful analysis for a lot of different folks. Um, let me go ahead and stop sharing my screen and just share a few other thoughts as you're going about these more advanced analytics. Um, so as you're kind of diving into these things that you could start to draw some conclusions from, maybe you would see those numbers and say, wow, well, X institution has a lot more risk than Y institution. Uh, remember that Humda data are really great signals of fair lending risk, but they don't have, um, at least the public version of them, doesn't have all the credit profile data in there. Um, so you don't know someone's uh, like, like credit score, you don't know the loan to value ratio, you don't have all like 100% of the information about underwriting that went into that. Um, and so do be cautious with that data and um, be thoughtful about the conclusions that you're drawing from it. Okay, um, so with that, I will turn it back over to Patrice to talk about how we use analytics like this at the Bureau. 
Thanks very much, Abby. That was such an impressive demonstration. It actually made me think I might want to try to play with Excel someday. We'll see. Um, putting the pieces together, I will now explain how Abby Hogan and other talented analysts at the CFPB use Humda data to protect America's consumers. As previously mentioned, nearly every office at the CFPB uses Humda data. Certainly, Humda data are foundational for our fair lending work. We use Humda data in a variety of ways in our fair lending efforts, including for market monitoring of the mortgage market to better understand the market size and landscape, also for prioritizing our work. We prioritize our efforts where consumers have the greatest potential to be harmed. We also use the Humda data to identify Humda non-reporters. That's what we call financial institutions that are required to report Humda data under the law, but fail to do so. This is important because mortgage lenders that are Humda non-reporters or those who report poor quality data may also have poor compliance in other consumer financial protection areas. We also use Humda data to identify redlining risks, as Abby was demonstrating. I will speak more about redlining a little later. Finally, we use Humda data for reporting purposes, including in our Fair Lending Annual Report to Congress, where we describe all of the CFPB's fair lending efforts from the previous calendar year. Humda data are so important to our work, it should not be surprising that the Bureau prioritizes Humda data integrity year after year in our fair lending supervision efforts. And as previously mentioned by the director, the CFPB will not hesitate to take public enforcement action against institutions for failing to properly report Humda data as required by law. As the director mentioned during her opening remarks, Last year, the Bureau announced a settlement with Freedom Mortgage Corporation, one of the 10 largest Home Mortgage Disclosure Act or Humda reporters nationwide. Freedom is a mortgage lender with its principal place of business in Mount Laurel, New Jersey. For each year from 2013 to 2016, it originated or made more than 50,000 home purchase loans, including refinancings of home purchase loans. Freedom is required to collect, record, and report data on these transactions under Humda and its implementing regulation, Regulation C. The CFPB found that Freedom violated the law by submitting mortgage loan data for 2014 to 2017 that contained errors. Specifically, the Bureau found that Freedom reported inaccurate race, ethnicity, and sex information and that much of Freedom's loan officers' recording of this incorrect information was intentional. For example, certain loan officers were told by managers or other loan officers that when applicants did not provide their race or ethnicity, they should select non-Hispanic white regardless of whether that was accurate. Under the terms of the consent order, the Bureau required Freedom to pay a civil money penalty of $1.75 million and to take steps to improve its compliance management to prevent future violations. Because Humda data are so important to the Bureau and to other regulators, policymakers, researchers, economists, industry, and consumer advocates, the Bureau takes measures to increase compliance with Humda through enhanced education efforts and direct outreach to potentially non-compliant mortgage lenders. In 2019, the Bureau issued warning letters to a group of mortgage lenders indicating that they may be required to collect, record, and report information about their mortgage lending activity under Humda and Regulation C, and that they may be in violation of the law for failing to report that information. These warning letters urge the recipients to review their practices to ensure their compliance with all relevant laws. The recipients were encouraged to respond to the Bureau to advise if they have taken or will take steps to ensure compliance with the law or to tell the Bureau if they think their activities do not trigger Humda reporting requirements. And the Bureau is committed to following up on these warning letters to ensure compliance with Humda. The Bureau sent similar warning letters to potentially non-compliant mortgage lenders in 2016. 
since we began issuing HMDA warning letters in 2016, more than 140,000 mortgage loan applications that previously went unreported by lenders have now been reported. Due to the tremendous success of this project, we hope to continue it in the future. As I mentioned earlier, HMDA data has been especially instrumental in the Bureau's fight against redlining. Redlining is a term used for an illegal practice where people living in a certain area or neighborhood are not given the same access to credit as people in other areas or neighborhoods on the basis of race, color, or for some other prohibited reason. Though this practice of redlining has been illegal for decades, it still goes on today. The CFPB uses HMDA data to help identify redlining risk in mortgage lending. In 2016, the Bureau jointly announced with the Department of Justice an enforcement matter against Bancorp South. The complaint filed by the CFPB and the Justice Department alleged that Bancorp South engaged in numerous discriminatory practices. Specifically, Bancorp South illegally denied fair access to credit to residents in minority neighborhoods in the Memphis area by, among other things, opening branches and targeting its marketing activity outside of minority neighborhoods. These actions discouraged prospective borrowers in minority communities from applying for credit. Bancorp South also unlawfully denied African American applicants certain mortgage loans and overcharged some of its African American customers. The CFPB also sent undercover testers to several Bancorp South branches to ask about getting a mortgage loan and found that the Bancorp South employees treated African American testers worse than they treated white testers with similar credit qualifications. For example, bank employees provided information that would have restricted African-American testers to smaller loans than white testers. As a result, under the consent order, Bancorp South was required to pay $4 million in direct loan subsidies in minority neighborhoods in Memphis, to pay at least $800,000 for community programs, advertising, outreach, and credit repair services, to pay $2.78 million to African-American consumers who were unlawfully denied mortgage loans or overcharged for mortgage loans, and a $3 million civil money penalty. As just described, in resolving this lawsuit, the Bureau required Bancorp South to take a number of actions to increase access to credit for majority African American communities in the Memphis area. These actions included a loan subsidy program that offered qualified applicants mortgage loans on a more affordable basis and the opening of new branches in the formerly redlined areas. This is only one specific example of how the Bureau has used HMDA data to improve the lives of mortgage borrowers. And I'm proud to say that Abby Hogan played a key role in the HMDA analytics that led to this historic enforcement action. Before closing, I just want to direct your attention to the CFPB's HMDA resources. The CFPB has created an entire suite of resources for both HMDA reporters and for users of HMDA data, including data point articles written by the Bureau's own researchers that provide observations from the annual HMDA data and note recent trends in the nation's mortgage market. We also have links to all the FFIEC's HMDA-related resources that are organized by year. These resources include frequently asked questions, information for mortgage lenders on how to file HMDA data, including the annual filing instruction guide, which we affectionately refer to as the FIG, modified loan application registers, or LARS, that provide loan-level data for individual mortgage lenders as modified by the Bureau to protect applicant and borrower privacy. Aggregate and disclosure reports, which summarize mortgage lending activity both nationwide and by specific areas. And snapshot and dynamic reports, I'm sorry, snapshot and dynamic national loan level data sets, which provide access to the national HMDA data 
reported by mortgage lenders, also modified by the Bureau to protect applicant and borrower privacy. You can also access HMDA-related tools on our website, including the HMDA data browser that Abby Hogan demonstrated today. There are also other HMDA resources aimed at mortgage lenders who report HMDA data, but may also be useful for data users, including institutional and transactional coverage charts. Institutional coverage charts help determine whether an institution is required to report HMDA data. Transactional coverage charts help determine whether a mortgage transaction is required to be reported under HMDA. Regulatory and reporting overview summaries, which provide information about the HMDA data required to be collected and reported for a particular year. We have links to the Bureau's user-friendly version of Regulation C, which implements HMDA, and executive summaries of all our rulemaking activities affecting Regulation C and HMDA data collection. While these resources are hyperlinked in our presentation, which will be made available online shortly, so you can come back to the Bureau's website after this webinar to find this information. In the meantime, you can find these and other HMDA resources on the Bureau's website at consumerfinance.gov. In closing, I'd like to thank you again for joining us today. If you have further questions, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. If you have questions about the Office of Fair Lending or the Bureau's Fair Lending work more generally, please email us at cfpb underscore fair lending at cfpb.gov. If you have questions about the HMDA data browser that Abby demonstrated today, please email our HMDA operations team at humdahelp, that's H-M-D-A-H-E-L-P, at CFPB. Gov. Thank you very much. This concludes our session, and I hope you have a great rest of the day.